So we're going to stick with the regular agenda. We're going to start with the Kate issue. Um, we will both of you here shortly. He needs to be. Um, because I have a certain viewpoint on this Kincaid thing, and I'm the one that asked him to be sent to the committee, I'm going to let uh, Amy Dabosky chair this particular part of the media so I can speak my piece. Okay, good. Um, so we're just now starting today with playing. Have you already been That's what happens when you're late. Okay, so let's just start with um, uh, the administration since this is coming for request to the mayor. Who wants to present? Before? So we're waiting for the municipal attorney who is on his way. Yeah, so we, we prefer to, to push that back until later since he's really been the point person on this and this is a matter that deals with uh, legal issues. Uh, we can speak to some of the background and the history of how we, uh, how the team developed the lease proposal for Kincaid Park. But I think the, the root of the issue that John really wants to discuss is really legal in nature. And so without Paul to hear, we're, we're not in a position to discuss it. Well, let's right. let's do the background then. Yes, yeah, sure. sure. I think that's helpful too to understand it. So, uh, yeah, John, you want to start? Um, I think everybody recognizes that uh, you know, over the course of time, Kincaid, uh, in general terms, as it's been developed, it's got some shortfalls in uh, communication capacity. Uh, we've had uh, off and on proposals over the years. We have cows out there. Robin has handled. Um, we also have a very small antenna occasionally. Uh, but our overarching uh, umbrella of coverage um, is, uh, is lacking severely. Um, as the trails develop, the single track uh, also develops. Um, as more and more people visit the beach, now we have a whale situation, which is causing other issues. We've realized over time, we've known over time, we've realized even more magnified have some serious safety concerns uh, in and around Kincaid Park. And I can point to a very specific example that happened actually one week ago today. And that was with our summer adventure camp. <clears throat> you take a bunch of kids out on a trail, and when you least expect it, something weird happens. And a kid decides to bolt into the woods. Um, immediate response is grab your phone and call. There's no coverage. There was no communication. They couldn't communicate with anybody. And so we sent staff out to grab the kid. Who's, I'm not going to get into the details, but it got messy. <clears throat> and ultimately um, got him and, and kept him under control. But at no time could anybody communicate with anybody in and around the area. No place, there was no coverage. It took another staff to beat feet up the trail to get to a spot where they finally got coverage and notified the chalet who sent other staff out. This is a week ago, this is a 10 year old Now, put that in perspective. So, that, I mean, I'm not saying I'm glad it happened, but it really emphasizes the need that we have in that area because we have people, we all know about the people that have taken off down on the beach and tried to walk Fire Island. You know, I mean, as goofy as that sounds. Okay, but they did it, you know. And, and so we've had rescues, we've got people lost, we had the situation with Luke Simpson, you know, that happened on the single track trails. Well, you know, at the time, there was no communication. Okay, and this guy is what, quadriplegic now? Uh, we, we've got things that happen in the area, and, and we've also got the the human wildlife, you know, interaction. Uh, we've had circumstances around that. The cows work to a certain extent. The small tower on the chalet works to a certain extent. We have no overarching ability to reform the kind of duties that we are required to do. The, the, the public expects us to do. Okay, and that situation a week ago really does emphasize how badly overarching coverage to cover everybody's use within the park. John, so, I think we have a question for you today. John, has a tow committee issue come and identified the dead zone? Yes. There's I know a lot of times other ones, they've identified the dead zone, so they brought proposals for it to put a tower up. So I want to yes. know 
Where's the dead zone out there? Oh, there's a lot of dead zones. There are it, a lot. It's not just a dead zone. It, there's, um, I don't know, Robin, do you have? Color connotation. I don't One tower is taking care of the call. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Half tall. That's shot. Four to five feet. That's on the sphere. I don't think it is. No. And we've already, the FAA's already blessed all this. And we've gone through a whole series of dialogue with both the proposers, with the San Luis Community Council, user groups, um, yeah. she has received unanimous support across the board. People understand that we have a gross deficiency in being able to serve the public's needs from a safety standpoint. Uh, it also brings other benefits, and that's part of what has kind of brought this package together much more uh, importantly from the standpoint of, we all know Kincaid is a world-class facility. It holds major events, worldwide events, national events, international local events, etc. There's no capacity to do live streaming, for example. If you want instant results and you want to send them off, we can't do that stuff. Okay, so part of the proposal is they're going to bring us the capacity both to the chalet, the bunker, and then also over to the biathlon area. So that it's these things that we continue over time to embrace more and more use of the park. And God help us, we have a winter that actually allows for it this year. Um, but the idea behind it is that you know, this, this is even a, a more useful tool, both for us, but for promoting the facility for um, world-class events, uh, competitions uh, in the future. The big deal, though, is, is really it's about, it's about public safety. And, uh, and this gives us what we need, what the public needs, um, and I think what, um, and I'm not gonna speak for the fire department, but we called you guys out we ground proof now with GPS to some track trails. Um, that was an important piece of it. But you can you can GPS all you want, but if you can't communicate, there's there's no benefit. And so that's really the big issue. For you, I think. Yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so you think 45 is going to do it long term because you know some of these trees are going to grow taller. <laughs> And we don't want to have to add another 10, 15 foot on it over the time. I'm not worried about that. Um, this has been cited within the park uh, to give us the current and long term ability for coverage without any interferences. Okay? So, um, there's a couple of things. Amy would know this, and others, I mean, of course, you know, we see tell tel towers various shapes and sizes and forms and heights and whatever. You know. uh, the FAA would not want us to have something sticking out there on a flight track, you know, out there and I don't think the public wants anything. You know, it's 90 feet high or something like yeah. that. But I believe the engineering behind this uh, does provide, you know, I don't speak for GCI, but you know, they can speak for that. But uh, this does give us the ability for, for long term be able to have that uh, communication capacity uh, covered all the way around to the park. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, and we just want to say good morning to Tyler Robinson, one of our committee members Hi. from PNC. Um, Mr. Steele. Uh, yeah, um, Micah said, we've got, we've, we have one location that we cited uh, down by the chalet fairly recently. Um, one of the cows? Pardon me? One of the cows? Yeah. And, and I know that there's uh, uh, communication or something on the way in on the right hand side. Correct. And uh, so is there any co-location or, or is, where is, where is the tower? I'll let speak to what is going to, this, uh, this tower brings one thing, but it also takes care of other things as yeah. well. So I'll let Robin speak. One of the, we started the research about three years ago to identify coverage, dead zones, and so on, and what would take care of that because our overarching goal, goal is to have one consolidated tower that has the three major carriers on it, and then we will revoke all of the cell wheels permits, the antennas, and so on. Everyone will be located on that cell tower, and there is room for all three carriers on that, um, and then we'll take... If you've passed the, the cell on wheels on the right that you're yeah. talking about, that is 65 feet tall. And no offense to, I think it's GCI. 
ugly. It, it, well, very it, ugly. it looks commercial. It I mean, does. It's very commercial. That's real. So we will take away all of those permits for um, the, the revocable permits for all of those other locations. Everyone will be required to be located. We have letters of intent for the other two carriers. So GCI will put it up if the other two carriers will go on it. But that is the, the idea is to have everything co-located. Mm -hmm on one tower. That would take care of uh, TV coverage and all that other stuff as well. I mean, whatever else might come up. That is correct. The fiber optic cable that comes in will give high-speed internet yeah. and, and benefits that so far that they have not had. The other benefit uh, we found, that we have several of the groups out there that are very excited. They cannot take registrations on site because they have no cell coverage, so they can't use their squares and so on. So they're rather excited about being able to do all of that, their event registrations, everything can now be on site. Okay. Resolution 2016-12 in your request, right? It says up to 50 feet to tower, you said under 45 feet. So what are we doing with 50 or 45? It's 45. Oh, it 45. Yeah, 45, okay. It's just really my day and age, everybody looks like it has a cell phone. And it would be good to have coverage from my perspective. They got 16 grandkids, very major. I want to make sure they're out there. We can communicate with them. Okay, are there any other comments on this topic before um, we move on? Just a comment that Bill Halsey uh, is on his way. He let me know. <laughs> be here a moment yes, there, Daddy. Uh, yes, sir. So, Terry Schoenfeld again, current planning bed. <clears throat> the uh, the cow the cow towers are are allowable on wheels because we don't have to pay for the wheel. My understanding. It's somehow related to that. Is there a requirement then that that this the permanent steps for the towers part would require some public? That is that's really a dual policy question. question. Yeah. The answer is no. Okay. I'll give you a preview of what he's going to say. <laughs> no. uh, but he'll give you a lot more details of why the answer is no. Okay. He's one of those two things. Yeah, Mr. Love. I think we probably need to wait for a bill because the answer is yes. And uh, I'll give you a lot of simple statements on why that's clearly the case. So, um, but I, I would say, too, I don't question the value of having it whatsoever. I mean, I ski race out there and bike race out there. My daughter got lost in the woods on a Tuesday night race out there. Um, you know, I mean, it's very, very clear. I, I just believe that the clear statement of the charter is that this kind of thing that happens. Quickly, and I expect fully that it would pass overwhelmingly. But I just don't think we can back ourselves. No matter how valuable it is, we can't go against the charter. I don't think we can do that. And I guess I think maybe some other note with upside bill. So if we were to send it to a vote, could it go on the November ballot? To make it sooner? No, we What's can't. The the July 1 was our 100th day, so it would go on the 2018. Unless, uh, November, so, yeah, November. Of unless the assembly decided to have a special election, now we're trying this whole by mail thing. Maybe we could get. I mean, this before the bill gets here. Get some a little background, maybe from GCI. Do you want to familiar with the con general contracts for cell towers and so on? Well, this this has been worked out. And unfortunately, the the specialist in, in our land use and cell tower is on maternity leave, so you got me. Uh, but the the history out there of trying to get coverage has been a spotty one. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it's the cow. We later then put a small tower on the, the which everybody calls the bunker, the, the adjacent bunker to the, to the main facility. Uh, the, the problem is just siting and design, and uh, over a long term, we settled on the facility at the location it is using the terrain. I mean, you have several problems with terrain around airports. So this way, you use a hill, you use an adjacent power source here. It's close to the main facility, <clears throat> and it's also close to the, the main utility easements coming into the road, essentially coming into the facility. So uh, cell towers these days have evolved because of uh, Mr. Traney's grandchildren using data. 
it used to be you put in one tall tower somewhere and you could get voice. Now, because of the data needs, you need a lot of facility backbone to get to it. So the design kept changing and kept changing until using the terrain, using the latest technology, and then using fiber optic backbone, not only to the cell tower, but then sharing that with the facility and the, uh, uh, the uh, media, or however the municipality wants to parse it out. Um, all came together and worked. Uh, the latest development was the use of a stealth tower. It is a tree tower, so it's not just your monopole. Um, and it was designed with, uh, with specific engineering parameters in mind. Uh, the three carriers have different uh, bandwidths that they broadcast on. So <clears throat> every antenna doesn't have to fight for the same optimum space. So that was one advantage. Uh, it, we kept within the, uh, the height parameters and got space for all three of the major carriers here. Yep, Laura, I have So um, just in general, with cell mm -hmm. towers, not this one in particular, um, what, what is a typical lease term dollar It really depends. Um, the, the dollar amount would depend on how the, the tower is set up. This one is set up so that the space for all three carriers is included in the lease. And that's not typical in Alaska. Generally, one party puts up the cell tower and has their little shelter, and then the landowner actually leases out the other uh, the land pieces. Uh, I'm not totally familiar on how that was established, but it's a fair market value. And, uh, and then there was some small uh, credit back for the laying of the fiber optic cable in the easement that we were dedicated. So are the terms usually uh, five, 10 years, 15? And they're pretty heavy. What does it cost to build it? Uh, that I can't really, I mean, I can't tell you, but we could tell you. Uh, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And typical towers, hundreds of thousands. Yes, yeah, especially with the, with the the extra for the uh, stealth tree and the uh, 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 design for three. Um, and generally leases that I've reviewed, and again, I'm not the specialist, but the leases that I've reviewed are in the three to five year range, uh, and they generally have renewable terms. And usually the terms go to some sort of a price adjustment. Robin may be able to help us on this one because I'm thinking about some of the leases that have come before the assembly for cell towers, whether it's at like a high school or some a or AWWU. Typically, I think I've seen five-year leases. Um, most of those are now 10-year leases and with, with optional renewals. The one at Bartlett, I believe, is like a 10-year. Well, several five-year I can't years. remember what the one at North Court was. That was an A move study. I'm, I want to say a five year lease, but I, can't, I I might be wrong. But the terms are typically not one year, John. Typically, they are five years or longer. And the value depends. I, I would say the fiscal note sometimes is right around like five or ten thousand dollars a year or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so when you build these, um, it's a significant investment, and would you consider it something that you'd be okay removing after with thirty day notice? Yes, we have made, GCI has made the decision through its wireless and through its capital that this is worth it. Is, is that typical? It's not, it's not typical if you view it, if the only consideration is the bottom line, it's not worth it. So I mean, why, that's a fair so statement. So why in this case would you do that? Because we live here. But the 30 and, day. Well, we, the, the reason it was negotiated was the facility is needed. I mean, when somebody, when somebody dies going to Fire Island, the, the, we get the phone calls, okay? Uh, we support uh, a lot of community, uh, a lot of community services, a lot of things that happen in Kincaid. And, and it was that the finance people don't like it. And the wireless people said, we are willing to commit to do this. And, and the, the way we understand it and the way it was negotiated was the, the assembly has defined, I don't 
people wait for bill. The assembly has defined the terms under which you could do this, and we are willing to sign up for those terms. So, so what I understand you're saying is that the, the agreement to have a 30-day, that you might have to tear it down with 30-day notice, was done to fit within the parameters of not having to vote. It is our intent, and obviously it isn't finalized until the assembly. I mean, the, the administration has decided to just not backdoor it, not just sign a revocable use permit based on the ordinance alone. They decided, that, okay, we'll bring this out, and we, I mean, we have no choice, but we, we don't think that's a bad idea. And we, it's our intent to sign something with, and, and commit to the terms within the ordinance. Um, can, can we, can I, yeah, Mr. Stone, I think I had one question. Yeah, my, my, my question is, um, I imagine that the city owns a space and the, uh, the users, the three users or more, um, lease the, uh, the facility, lease that space and build the facility. Is that the case? Yes, GCI so, actually in this case is. So the users own the towers. Uh, right. Can you sublease or? Well, um, it, it's 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 actually called co-location okay. in in the telecommunication jargon, but it's designed for them to come on, and that's why the space here was actually negotiated. That we're paying for space that if they don't come on, we still pay for the space. Mr. Hamilton, uh, you know, it's a, it, I kind of ask those questions to lead up to the view that I have. But just a few weeks ago, we. I guess read and approved an audit of the <coughs> PCAR. And one of the um, kind of problems that the auditors found was that someone who had a credit limit of, I think, $1,500 may purchase something that was more than that with their PCAR. And it was something that was good to buy, the city needed it. His credit limit was, I think, $1,500. So he broke it up into, he or she broke it into three or four pieces to technically get underneath that limit to buy this thing. So the purpose was good, but the way they did it was clearly not within the spirit of the rules. And I don't know if they got reprimanded or not, but it was in the audit and we all went, yes, that was bad. It should have happened. So when this comes forward, I see that this uh, lease has been <coughs> set up to get just underneath those rules. Um, it's unusual to have a three-year lease, as we've heard, but that gets it underneath the rules. Um, it's very unusual to claim that it's something that could be removed in 30 days. You've got something hundreds of thousands of dollars to build. So it's not realistic to really say it's a 30 day removal item. It just gets it underneath our criteria. So the lease has been kind of built in an unusual way to get underneath the clear rules that the assembly set with clear guidance for the charter. And that's what bothers me. You know, I understand the need and I understand the safety features of the cell phones out there. I do. It's a huge amount. But we have but we have rules to follow. And either we change those rules or we follow them. I believe this is the case for the rule. I'll just on the and I don't think we need to change it. It seems to me that that's a lot of work. Okay. Mr. Halsey has joined us. Uh, Bill, are you ready to jump right in? <laughs> <laughs> Always ready to jump. Okay. We're at right so let me, let me give you a, a little recap. So we've talked a little bit about the history of it. We've talked about typical leases, and um, there's been a few questions going back and forth, and the safety needs, obviously, that are out in the K-K. Um, so if you could give us uh, your legal spiel. All right. The legal spiel is the charter since 1975 has had a provision in the Title in Article 10 that is actions that require ordinances. And Section 8 of actions that require ordinances are those that convey or lease or authorize conveyances of any interest in lands of the municipality. And it further goes on to say, an ordinance conveying an interest in real property dedicated to a public park for recreational purposes is valid only upon approval of the majority of those voting on the question. Can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry. Can you speak up a little bit? One more time. So, the, Article 10 of the Charter since 1975 has stated which actions of the Assembly require an ordinance. One of those is to convey or lease or authorize the conveyance or lease of any interest in lands of the municipality. It goes on to say, an ordinance conveying an interest in real property dedicated to a public park for recreational purposes is valid only upon a majority of those voting on the question at a regular or special election. 
charter has at its adoption, they realized that that caused some problems because it gummed up any kind of land conveyances in a, in a dedicated park. And so they went back and in 1976, I believe, added a definition of interest in lands designed to soften that slightly. And interest in lands is now a defined term meaning any estate and real property or improvements thereon, excluding revocable permits or licenses, right-of-ways, or easements, which the assembly finds to be without substantial value to the, to the municipality. So, the question for the assembly is, in each one of these cases, whether what is being conveyed or leased or signed is with or without substantial value to the assembly. And the charter says the assembly gets to make that call and doesn't provide a lot of side for it. What we have understood to be the practice is that of substantial value of the assembly has always been, in practice, assessed with reference to what the municipality is giving up, not how much it's getting in money or what uh, the consequence of the conveyance is going to be. But for in terms of public park purposes, you can think of it as what's being impaired. And in this specific circumstance, I think it is our sense that it is entirely within the assembly's discretion to say, this is a portion of a, a very a small portion of a very much larger park. This is not impairing any existing trail network. This is actually only enhancing the park. And so what the municipality would convey or lease in this ordinance would not be of substantial value to the municipality. But it is a case-by-case -case determination because the exact same cell tower proposal in Town Square Park likely would totally impair the park, and so it would be of substantial value to the assembly. But the legal position, I think, is that it's ultimately a raw call for the assembly to make, and except in extreme circumstances, I don't think a reviewing court would have a lot of grounds to interfere with the assembly's choice. Mr. Steele, I have a question. Yes, the, uh, it seems to me to be argued that this actually increases the value of the property by the security that it provides uh, to the users of that park, and therefore, it's not necessarily a detriment. I think that is certainly the case. Um, I will say, though, that I'm not sure that legally that argument gets you very far because the charter is written in terms of what is being conveyed or leased, not what the ultimate end stage is after the conveyance or lease. Requirements, but we should be clear about what those requirements are. Um, 
there's not so much requirements as per se pre-authorization to the administration from the assembly that says, so long as you meet these criteria, you don't have to bring any kind of ordinance to us at all. So the charter is saying the assembly is required to use ordinances to convey or lease interest in lands and public parks send to the voters, unless it's conveying or, or leasing something that's without potential value. Well, rather than having to ask the assembly on each and every occasion, what is a substantial value? The assembly in 2015 passed 253020 that said, we will give you an advanced answer for a small category. The small category is, if the state lease is $50,000 or less, if the term is a year or less, or if the structure can be removed within 30 days, you don't even have to ask us. Those are clear. But those are not charter requirements. Those are, you don't have to bother asking me anymore requirements that the yeah. assembly invented in 2015 and are not set in stone and could be changed. So that's the rules of the road in terms of the code. To the to the point that this lease was massaged to fit or feel close to those terms, I think that's probably the case, but I don't think there's anything nefarious about that. I think the notion was where the assembly has given pre-authorization to say, we don't think these things have substantial value, that we could get pretty close to that line or under that line. And, um, you know, for belt and suspenders, measure, cut, measure twice, cut once, purchases brought the question back to you. Um, but, I, but I think that's right. So that's how those rules are playing in connection with the chart. But I will say that my, I'm not a technical expert in subject matter, expert, but I, my understanding is that the tower really could be removed in 30 days and that uh, it, it, it's not technically challenging to do that. Uh, I have a question for you, Bill. I didn't see it anywhere where, where I could even quite kind of massage it in, but when we're talking about a, a significant public safety need or filling a public safety gap, is there anything in code or in charter that would allow us the assembly to take that factor into consideration? And, um, uh, you know, John has the same concern I have in that it clearly appears that this is something that the voters should basically say because to me, I don't know that the charter was um, broad enough to let us bypass them in this particular situation, but is there anything that we can use to say, you know, this is a public safety issue and that gives us, in this part of the code or charter, that gives us the ability to say yes. Um, I would have to take a closer look at that. Uh, it is not an angle that we have explored thoroughly, uh, in part because, like I said, uh, the charter is written in such a way that the ultimate benefit that redounds from the advance release is not part of the consideration as to whether you need an ordinance and whether you have to send it to voters. There are provisions in the charter for emergency ordinances. I don't know that this would necessarily qualify, given that we've had a lack of services in the area for decades. And it's not on fire yet. So, so I say, I guess I, would, I don't have an answer for you now. I, I'm not aware of one as I'm sitting here. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. But I think a case could be made that we almost had an emergency with the young man that got lost in the woods the other day, and there was no cell tower coverage available. And so, <laughs> fortunately, they were able to find him. But you know, he could have been lost in the woods for a significant amount of time and there are wild animals in the woods he could have got injured or killed so i would think that his parents and relatives would think we have an emergency and as i'm saying if you do that that might, might well be the case the emergency ordinance provision generally designed just to let the assembly pass introduce and pass ordinances at the same time and then emergency ordinances lapse after so I don't know that it is a, if it is a fix available to the assembly here, I'm not sure it's a permanent fix unless we're doing the rolling as the emergency ordinance is coming from. Dick, and then Tim, and then John. Just from my perspective, the charm was put together in 75, 76, right? How many do you put back then? Probably mm -hmm. nobody. The technology changes. We have to change the technology. Today, everybody has a cell phone. We can set the cell phone you've got coverage. Have part of our town that doesn't have this coverage that a lot of people go to. I'm thinking about the kids that try, for God knows why, taking a canoe or walking for our island. They probably have a cell phone with them. I don't want to lose one of them because we did want a cell tower. Ultimately, you said that somebody makes a decision on this. We've got the ability to make decisions for them to do that. 
Yeah, uh, my, my point is, uh, I've been involved in orienteering with elementary school kids. We've used that part. And so you, by definition, you've got all these little kids running around with a map and a compass. Uh, some of them are pretty good with it, some are not so good with it. I know that uh, we were scared to death that somebody was going to get lost in, uh, back there. And, uh, so I think it's needed, number one. And number two, if we need to uh, tweak something for this particular circumstance, uh, then we need to do it. And uh, we're for it, so we can do it. Well, um, actually, one point, uh, Mr. Cheney, uh, the municipal boundaries go deep into Chico State Park, and there's not good cell coverage out there. We're just dropping out into the next drainage over, and uh, hopefully there will never be cell coverage out there. But uh, question: If if this, what is the time schedule to build this? I mean, if it were to go to a vote in April, how much would that delay um, your building? It? Are you ready? Well, to I mean, we're we're subject to all of the same problems. The municipality will stop letting us put the fiber in the road to backfill the tower on, on the frost date. So you're talking about the uh, next building. If it went to April, I mean, honest to God, it might never get built because we'll be into a new capital cycle and we would have to make the decision all over again. I'll raise my hand for myself a bit. Uh, so I have another thought. Um, if we look at this as truly a one-year uh, but potentially revocable lease and the assembly were to pass it is there a way that we could um i know there is but could we build in language in there just saying that the lease is subject you know the lease is approved um conditionally subject to voter approval in april passed the notification, 180 day notification, so it would have to be in November of 2017. No, 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 you, you're not understanding what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the assembly approves it, but we put, add something into there saying it's going to be on the ballot, and if some, if the voters reject it, then the lease is revoked with 30 day notice. So, so two things I can say to that are the first, the 180 day notice I'm less concerned about. The 180 day notice was added three years ago, something like that, to say that whenever you're proposing a conveyance in a dedicated park, you have to give an extraordinary 180-day notice of the ordinance before you can adopt the ordinance, which I'm not sure where they came up with that number, but six months later, you probably forgot that it was introduced. So the assembly, just, that's not written stone anywhere. The assembly can modify the 180 days. The, the way the charter is written is, Ordinance conveying an interest in real property dedicated to a public park or recreation for purposes is valid only upon approval of a majority of those voting on the question. So I suppose we have to give some hard thought to whether there can be a lease that allowed occupancy and construction ahead of the vote. Is this well, so the determining factor here is the assembly, if we approve it, we're saying there's not a substantial interest, but if we put it on the ballot, we're saying there probably is a substantial interest. So we're kind of arguing both sides, but um, obviously, I think I think the charter could be written better. I think it could be given given a little bit more flexibility. You want to volunteer for um, that duty? <laughs> but it but it's not, as John points out. And I think your points. I, I think you may have swayed me because your points when you talk about code and the assembly getting to define what is a substantial interest. Um, I do I do feel like we're kind of on that verge where we've completely. Um, massage this so we don't have to go to the voters and I don't uh, that makes me very uncomfortable so I'm trying to see if there's a, a happy medium here um, and again it comes down to we approve it but we approve it saying yeah okay but we're still gonna ask the voters I mean I don't know how to do that because, well, I yeah. think it's a general okay. matter a couple of responses I think that the administration's position was that even a sort of off-the-shelf typical cell phone lease probably could be declared by the assembly to be without substantial value because it wouldn't require a lot of people. But any massaging that occurred was to get it close to what the assembly had already said they determined to be without substantial value. But I think if the assembly is comfortable with the notion that what's purporting to be conveyed 
here is without substantive value. They could pass the ordinance, and then for, if they just felt beyond charter reasons, for whatever reason, that they want to refer this to voters, the charter does have that mechanism as well, and say, we've passed a law and we want to know what the public sentiment is. So you certainly could say, it this without substantive value is valid now, but we do kind of want a second to point the apple and consent to the voters. Now, commercially, I don't know what that does. I think you know, at least it's a subject to a further vote of the ratification of the people in April. I don't know if that's what they want to do. Well, so, it's, you know, to me, it's no worse than their 30 day notice because they wouldn't be given notice. And I mean, it's kind of already there. But um, my, my question then is when we're talking about the charter itself, um, do you see a real, and obviously I'm asking you to predict what voters might do, but do you see a realistic way that we could? Create an inclusion for substantial for substantial public safety needs in, this, in the charter itself or in, the charter itself? in the charter itself. Oh, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Certainly, I, think I mean, always send a, a letter to the voters that, that would allow something. Because I think that would clarify in this particular situation. I think it would clarify because I think almost everybody would agree that there's a substantial public safety need. Um, but I, I just like I said, I think the charter is. Obviously, in 75, I didn't contemplate this particular thing. John? Um, it, it, yeah. it, it, what's, what's the cost of logistics of putting it on the November ballot? It, it, maybe if that 880 days is an ordinance, we could say, because this is, brings such value, we wait the 180 days and put it up to the vote in November. Yeah. Are you talking about this November? The problem is that's a state election. We have to get their permission and print with something on it. And they're probably, just from my perspective, it's too late. Yeah, that's 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 to do that. That's 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 You're not going to get it. If it was just our election, John could probably do it with this. You're talking about an election the state runs, and they would tell us what the result is. So you've got to meet their deadlines. And do we know for a fact that the state deadline for putting a question on the November ballot is coming on? I know that we have put we're, we're making a lot of before, yeah. but the musical person on this is got the expertise there. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly my Maybe point. Yeah, because here's my point is we just need to basically get the approval of uh, the state. We have to get the approval of the assembly to go to the state. Yeah, exactly. But my, that's my point is if the assembly determines this is an imperative question, <coughs> it's not unusual for the state. The state has put questions on ballots for us before without a lot of fanfare. So that may be an option. But the, the one thing that's not push it into the next building season anyway, instead of... Yeah, the, yeah that would put us, I mean, yeah. the, the, the tower is meaningless without the fiber-optic backbone, so you've got you've to gotta get that conduit in the ground, and that's the, the, the easement work. And then the footings for the tower, I mean, it is... Uh, the, the stealth tower takes more substantial footings because of the wind loading. So you would have to be <coughs> in the ground. I, I would think that the industry, industry would be, uh, would be we have something skeptical. Uh, <coughs> uh, wouldn't want to invest what like? they would have to invest in fiber optic you know, footings for the equipment. Text, uh, text, text, uh, knowing that it's going to the voters, <coughs> and the voters may say no. Oh, well, I, I guess I misunderstood. I, I'd have to go back to, to wireless and find out if they'd want to do that. That's actually I mean, um, if we, if we can't do it relatively quickly, because we're going to be off here. And then there's the whole question about when it does come out, you have to renegotiate that. Do they have to decide one way or another if they really want to do that uh, next year? So. I think, from my perspective, Ms. Paul, you may have actually. You should write this thing down. You may have actually swayed me. It might have happened. Um, I'll have to sleep on it though. It's like, um, I know, I know. Don't forget the meeting is recorded. I know, I know. It, it can happen. Um, but I think, I, I think there's been. I think this is sloppy, frankly. I, I think this is a definitely. Um, I think it could be cleaner, and that's why I guess I keep going back to how can we make this better in the future? Because if this is a problem, once it can't can't, can't can't. It can happen everywhere else. I mean, I'm thinking of Beach Lake. I'm thinking of all kinds of other places out in. I mean, I mean, Valley too. This is probably big dead zones, I'm sure. And parks, even. 
So I, I think this would be an issue that um, maybe we should look at if um, there's a way we can maybe propose a charter and then I don't know if the voters will pass it, but go ahead, John. No, you're fine. Uh, you know, just uh, another thing, I'm glad Phil Stiers here. Some years ago, we had the new transmission lines and we're going to go next, stay in the knees, maybe we're going to do more clearing, but you build these, build these huge towers right in front of people's yards on Elmore, just um, south of best place to put those would have been right in that park behind these homes. And as I recall, you chose not to do that because it would have taken the vote of the people and you stayed to pursue it. Whereas much like the cell tower, that would have, in the long run, been the best place to put them on people's front yards. It would not have used substantial park land. It would not have diminished the use. I mean, what was your experience with that? But you guys just didn't even want to go there. Is that right? Yeah, you're talking about section 16, which, you know, requires the vote. Um, and, and that's an accurate statement. I think on behalf of the utility, I'd argue, as I did back then, the best place for us to put facilities is where we can access them and maintain them. And I'm not sure the park actually, given a, alongside the road, fit that criteria. But it is true that uh, uh, we did encounter that Section 16 issue back in the day. Well, we have we have two yeah we have two options. We can just uh, report back that we discussed all the issues, and um, and that's it. Or we can take um, we can take have a motion for recommendation of either approval or denial or approval with conditions. So um, I'm not sure. The committee members now are you, uh, not you, um, you, me, Dick, and Pete. So, Dick. I'll make the motion to bring this forward this time with approval from this committee. With recommendation from the committee? second. Okay, so there's been a motion and a recommendation um, by Mr. Trey that this goes uh, forward to the assembly with a recommendation from the Community and Economic Development Committee for approval. <coughs> and seconded by Mr. Peterson. Is there a discussion? Well, I can't support it, though. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, it's okay. Um, and you know, I'm I'm torn on this one because I think Mr. Wellington's uh, points are um, incredibly val valuable, and I think they're valid. Um, so I'm not really sure even at this moment how I'm going to vote on the recommendation. Um, I might need some time to sleep on it. So with that, we'll just call for the vote. Um, Mr. Trini. Yes. Mr. Peterson. Yes. Mr. Wellington. No. And I vote no. So that would be good. That's how we another shot at Yeah, I know. I know. I, well, and I might go for an assembly. I just don't quite know yet. So it's going to the assembly without a recommendation. It's going right. without a recommendation, unless there's a secondary motion or something. I think as a committee, this is something that we should we should reevaluate uh, the charter language and the code language um, substantially and actually have them in front of us and look at them <coughs> for potential future modifications. I think that would be something good to put on our agenda. Okay. Do you want do you want me to move it back over to All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, secondary I guess we call it Title 23 Fire Code Appendix D. We call it the two egress thing. Is that cool? Can we have it known? Okay. Um, this, this, I think the broader view, Rick Davis has kept this alive in front of me and I think the city, but it is something that you know, I was involved in the Hillside Desert Plan for a number of years and a lot to develop a land up there that is the intent to ultimately develop for residential. This requirement impedes that it's for many good reasons, I think. But um, we need to kind of here to discuss it, see if there's a way forward to uh, allow development and, and with various accommodations. Although I'm going to speak to a specific project, uh, unfortunately, uh, Andre and a number of other developers. Uh, same problem in other circumstances, other areas, 
community <coughs> and uh, there's a broader, much broader interest to the development community on this issue. <coughs> um, let me be very clear, it's a very specific issue that I brought to John, uh, which is sort of within the envelope of this issue, is the effect of the 30 unit uh, limitation on our hires. <coughs> A lot of people think that when you sell a lot, you sell a lot based on putting all the costs for that lot and you sell it and make a little bit of profit. But the market determines the value of lots regardless of what the costs are. $3.4 million for the Potter uh, Highway Extension, Potter Road Extension, excuse me. Um, and we're not finished counting yet. <coughs> and we simply cannot amortize that and be with the market with 30 lots. 33 lots, we can. It's that simple. Uh, I think, frankly, the second the option in here, particularly with the additional explanation that we provide, I think for that provides an opportunity for an exemption to add maybe three or four lots there at the end of the temporary cul de sac, and that should help relieve that problem. Uh, believe it or not, um, uh, high end lots are not appreciating. Uh, very well in the market. Uh, they're flat or down. You're going to the development costs for those lots, and those lots run from one and a half to nine acres. Uh, it's rather substantial given the grade of also Potter uh, Drive, Potter Valley Road, uh, which is one of the things that I have to do with people looking to buy one of those lots. If you haven't been up there, I, I suggest you make a good one. Uh, because the driveway off of that road is a rather significant expense. Uh, but we do have uh, one lot sold, and there's another lot in process on the other side, so that's moving along. Uh, up on top, uh, we have a lot of interest in those lots are selling uh, faster, but they're cheaper because the lots are smaller and the views in uh, half of those lots you don't have. Them. Uh, we've had this discussion for a number of years uh, about what we in the building community refer to as the arbitrary 30, and we refer to it as what, what's the magic of 30? Why not 33? Why not 35? Uh, the magic of 30 we came out of the international uh, fire code, uh, and we constantly make changes to that. For example, we just completed a subdivision of the Hills and Tuckman with 43 lots in one row in, in one row down. Uh, now, of course, that's just at the bottom of the hill, not at the top of the hill. Um, one of the things we argued about a lot was the existing secondary egress, which has been there for a long time. And during the course of this fire, and thanks to John and the team, uh, we didn't have any serious problems up there. But uh, believe me, I think every piece of fire equipment at APD was up there. And they all used that access road in and out. And I interviewed the, engineer, the engineers or the drivers of those engines, and none of them had a concern about getting in and out of there. Uh, even when a pump truck was blocking part of that area uh, by taking a lot of creek to fill up some of the roads. Um, the other thing is all of the heavy equipment that we bring up there is supposed to, but can always happen, use the secondary egress as opposed to the main uh, road going up and down simply because we made it commitment to the homeowners association the lower half not to be running gravel trucks and heavy equipment up and down that road and we've not had no, no problem including a significant piece of equipment on large trailers coming around there now as you know we have a neighbor up there who has a large uh, rugby field um, and it's my understanding uh, although i have not seen it i'm told that uh, by his engineer that they have permits and a 40 foot extension on that cover which is ready to go with a 40 foot extension on that over that road, even though it's still in dirt, would be in excess of 33 feet high, which is the basic requirement for a rural collector. One other part of this to keep in mind is developers who are now forced to build collectors have no reimbursement. The reimbursement used to be 20 to two thirds uh, when the municipality takes the road. Uh, one of the things that developers are suggesting is. We might be able to do this a lot easier and make a lot more homes available if the community would at least pick up 50% of a cost of the uh, John and I talked a little bit about that, and I just put that on the table of something 
think about if you want to really increase the development of housing, particularly in these areas where you, you're running into a park or running into a cliff, it's very difficult to turn around and go back out again. Uh, you're just going to have a one way in, one way out. I provided you uh, just sort of a talking paper. This is not official, this is just a talking paper that I've been working on. And you'll see in there a long list of areas in the municipality that are one way in and one way out. Some of them are old places and some of them are new places that we're now in the process of inventory in the last few years, those that have been committed with one way in and one way out without a limit on pretty houses. So the first request is, is there a way we can find to uh, extend the 30 to 33 at Potter Pike Islands? That would help a great deal. Uh, if that's possible, uh, one client is very interested in that. Um, and then the broader thing is, uh, is there a way to look at these numbers and not be so arbitrary about 30? Uh, can we negotiate that? Particularly, again, when this is a multi-phase development. And the large chart shows you this phase is just as the phase is done, this is the next phase, this is the next phase, this is the other, of the other egress here. But at a community council meeting, the uh, Heritage Land Bank announced they have two very large parcels up there that they are now retracting or offering for sale in subdivisions. So that means, and I, and I don't know what the size of those lots will be, but that means at least probably another 40 or 50 residences up above us who will be using these same roads without contributing to the cost of those roads. So. Thanks. Uh, someone from administration? Sure. Um, a, a little bit of background. Um, this requirement for the secondary access came about when the codes went from the Uniform Building and Fire Codes to the International Building and Fire Codes. And that came about in the year 2000 for the 2000 code. Prior to that time, there was no specific requirement for secondary access. Um, however, the wording at that time was it's up to the authority having jurisdiction, the fire chief or fire marshal, to make that determination. And leading up to the 2000 requirement for this, this all came about because of the wildfires in California. And it was determined that all of these subdivisions that had 30 or more uh, structures on them, when people were evacuating, they were they were clogging up the single access route. So emergency <coughs> vehicles had an extremely hard time getting up there, and people had an extremely hard time evacuating to the point where people were lost, vehicles were trapped, and they burned in the fire. So. That's how we went from 99 to 2000 with this new portion of the code. Since then, there have been numerous, I hate to say this, there's been several times where we probably have missed subdivisions. We didn't see it during the planning stage or for whatever reason we didn't review it. So if there are uh, subdivisions that have 40 or more without the secondary access, Number one, we either missed it, or number two, the homes are spread for the uh, Most likely, we probably missed the review portion, and we should have asked for I'll the I'll check on that. Okay. I'm okay. um, <coughs> pretty sure we got comments for that, because it came out that there was no access. We could not get state approval to access on the hotline. So keeping that in mind, we try to be reasonable. If the state would say, no, you can't have access, or if there is a geographical feature that would not allow for the secondary access, we try to be, try to be reasonable and require something in lieu of that. For example, we have required in the past, and I shouldn't say require. If someone suggests to us that they want to do wildland urban interface construction, um, provide fire breaks, provide turnouts on the main road, do uh, firewise landscaping, then we allow that in lieu of the secondary access if there's a reason the secondary access is not feasible. So doing a quick look at the draft, um, the fire chief is mentioned. I'm not sure which fire tree chief, and I'm not sure which inspector. Yeah, but are you? 
are being referred to, but we have never not allowed the two exceptions. One of those exceptions is the secondary access is not required if all homes are sprinklered. If the entire project is sprinklered, we have we would not violate the codes ourselves and say, no, you still have to put in the secondary <coughs> access. Using the McHugh Creek fire as an example, if you can imagine all those folks evacuating down the one road while we have all the wildland vehicles, all the, the engines and the trucks and the tankers going up, it's going to be practically impossible for everyone to get out and for all of the emergency vehicles to get up. Now, talking about talking about interviewing the engineers that were up there, we will always take the most expedient route for emergency vehicles to take the secondary access is not really going to happen. We want to get there as quick as possible. So we would hope that the residents would take the secondary access as they would be directed to by the evacuating police department, whereas we would continue on in that same route that everyone was talking about, the main entry and access. Thanks. I, Stephanie, can you, I, I think one issue is kind of the road standards because we have, I mean, we, we could say we have secondary access through the Finland route, the goal is to, but that's, I mean, realistically people use that, but it's not up to city standards. And then is there parameters there? And, you know, the Hillside District Plan says below what probably is that ADT, you can have um, fairly simple road not being normal. Save 
30 units, some are below 30 units, some are above 30 units when you're kind of counting the number of that access individual roads, but eventually, really they all get down to having, either having to go down Potter Valley or go the back way, and those are really the only two alternatives to get in and out of there, and we're already at more than 100 plus units, and there is really a potential, as you say, to have a lot more. And let me point out that we don't suggest that the existing status of that road is acceptable, not uh, we, but we think with the addition of over uh, 40 foot extension and, and flattening the grade up, the grade is a significant problem, particularly the turn, uh, that that can be real, that can be solved quite easily. Uh, we'll, we'll be meeting with the gentleman on that property up there that apparently has a culvert permit to do it. Uh, so that we can work together. Uh, but uh, if, if the community's now going to open up significant areas there for subject of development, uh, is the community going to participate in the secondary evenings? Uh, we just think that makes sense, uh, particularly with two rather significant tracts of land. Uh, I'm, I'm a little con confused about something that Cleo said about the two exceptions. You said that you would not allow, you would not accept these two exceptions. No, I said we would. Oh, oh, sorry. I, I, I was yeah, um, we, we've had other cases within the poll itself, not even looking at, not even looking at Hillside or there to those areas outside of Arsa. We've had developments that basically could not construct the secondary access because there was a 12 foot difference between Bonifus and you know, where it's going. And so. Well, we can physically yeah. construct the secondary access. It's just yeah. not who, who's going to participate in that since it, it is effectively a collective. And uh, a great number of people will have the advantage of using that. And now, even more with the municipality opening those areas for residential development, uh, we just think the municipality should participate in it. If they do, I think we can move this forward rather quickly. And I just wrote any questions from some of the members? Uh, uh, I, I don't think there's any magic between 30 versus 35, but, but I, and I do uh, understand your point about if we're going to open up significant pieces of property then uh, we have to be responsible for helping out on the, the construction. Uh, safety is a huge issue. And, uh, even if we build in turnouts and things like that. Um, I, I, I just think uh, safety is important. And um, when we do it, we ought to look to the future as well as just what it is right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I, I actually know this area fairly well. And uh, uh, when you're in the pizza business, you, you learn about <laughs> cab drivers. And you know, uh, I, I, I've uh, used an unofficial shortcut out of that area many times. And that's, this was a couple decades ago. So. Uh, this this new road would, I think, be a great improvement uh, to, uh, for public safety because you would be able to get down Potter Valley and would be able to get over the, the Golden Mean. So you said would have two ways out of there. And, uh, so I, I I think the community probably, for public safety reasons, uh, it would be better if we did participate in it. We actually haven't, uh, we sort of lucked out with some rain this year that uh, we might find out, we had to find out how long it took to evacuate that area if the wind would have uh, stayed in the other direction and we hadn't got that rain. Uh, we, you know, we, we were really fortunate this year. And so uh, I think this road development that definitely creates a secondary road out of the road stuff. Perfect road to get out of there, and not uh, 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 most vehicles could would have been able to get in and out of there with the perception of the there. So, one of the things that I wanted to point out is all the properties in the subdivision uh, that were involved in wire, fire wise, uh, that's a co that's a code colored description within and it's inspected by a homeowners association. The thing that's nice, as I told John the other day. The fire got people real serious about it, uh, so we're not getting a lot of pushback on that at all. Uh, and in fact, we helped—we we actually helped, offered help 
two, I'd like to have a bigger map that shows me actually the roads so I can see the egresses for the whole picture, not just one section. Um, but the second thing, um, when I was hearing Cleo talk, it seems to me this is an, an impossible project because there's a lot of mitigate, there's a lot of factors that they'll consider using in exchange for a, maybe a, a dedicated secondary act egress, um, like the firewise landscaping, the bump outs, um, and the sprinklers. So I have a couple questions. First, in this particular area, you know, I'm sure you've looked at it, the map that went on. How many, when we're talking about potentially bump outs for um, you know, emergency vehicles and pullovers, pull outs, how many are you talking in this particular area? Well, in, in this particular area, there would, you really wouldn't need any because the way the driveways and stuff are set up, we have we have plenty of room to turn around. So <coughs> when we talk about bump outs, we're typically talking about a driveway 12 feet wide, 250 feet long. I know somebody who actually had to do a bump out in this driveway. So yeah, yeah okay, that makes sense <coughs> to me. Um, when we're talking about um, the potential for sprinklers, are you talking about every house has to be sprinklered? Or a potential or percentage? The or? potential is every house would be sprinklered. So if the first phase of the development were 30, then the second phase, here's what we found. The first phase might get sprinklered. The second phase, unless they read the flat notes, doesn't necessarily get sprinklered. But the intent behind that code requirement is that any houses on that particular road would all be sprinkled. Okay, so then my questions to the builders. How many of these houses in these particularly challenging areas are you actually sprinkling? On the, first, on the first phase, none that I know of. Uh, the cost of sprinklers based on the per square foot in some of these houses is twenty-five to thirty-five thousand okay. dollars additional to the cost of the house. Um, one of the things that, that I'm trying to remind is that we have talked to people about secondary power uh, because, believe it or not, when you're up there in a nice house, and the power goes on and off on a regular basis. So people yeah, that seem to be putting those things in the garage. Uh, having fought a fire uh, on one of my houses, having that power is the only way to stay alive. And having interior sprinkler is just absolutely a waste of time. If you don't have an exterior sprinkler, you only need to use it in the summertime. They don't have to they only be graded properly and take care of it. And it's available in the summertime. And an extra sprinkler is enormously effective. Uh, did that on my house. Fired all the way around my house and didn't even touch my house. The soap is the soap for the summer. Uh just very quickly, uh, when the developers do these subdivisions, flat notes get put on that they, everyone must sprinkler. <coughs> However, when people purchase those lots or builders purchase those lots, I've had at least 15 instances where the builder didn't notice that a uh, sprinkler system was required or the individuals who purchased the lot didn't notice until the home was actually under construction or completed. So. Leo's right. We, we wrestle with that all the time with, with yeah. people buying property. We show them the flat notes, et cetera, et cetera, and they hire their builder. You know, the problem for us is once they've bought that property, we, we, we ain't got a lot of control. Yeah. And uh, and so we sort of maybe call John and have him visit him. <laughs> I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a challenge. We're running close to the deadline, and I, I had one question for Stephanie's some administration. But we had uh, gold of you to expedite project there was the next in the part of disconnected. Um, this connection from Golden View to Potter Valley Road, and I believe Potter Valley Road is our Yes, both so Golden View and Potter Valley have been annexed. So is, um, how, was that difficult to annex Golden View? Could we annex this? It has to be voted on. Two separate votes. Two separate votes, yeah. Both ARTSA and the majority of the people taking it on, a majority of the people Unstopped freeload on the rest of us. It is impossible. John, if you can tell us on this, I've got some park land up there. I'd like to have a So, well, this is it's an option to look at. It is possible. So, um, I just real briefly, we had two new people come in. I know Andre's about. Did you have a few comments? Very brief. I guess 
guess, um, yeah, I guess just to, for the new staff members and the assembly members, that this isn't just a Potter Valley thing. Spinell Homes actually owns 40 acres just below, just west of Bear Valley, and we have an option to purchase another 40 acres just east of Goldview near 162nd. And we've heard from the UNI that you know no more plats over, you know, and we haven't got a number, but they've kind of said nothing over six lots can be platted in this area until the secondary collector mountain air drive goes through. And I don't know how many of you know, but the Muni actually had the money to do it and couldn't do it. So I, I don't know how a private developer or these, you know, these private landowners would be able to accomplish such a feat if the Muni couldn't do it with the $8 million appropriated for it. So money got yanked. Money got yanked. It's not that we had to play the game. Well, yeah. but it, it, it was there at one point, wasn't it? Not, never in the municipality's hands. It was an appropriation being proposed at the state level that at the last minute got redirected, unfortunately. Okay, did you? I'm you, Chuck Spinelli. Oh, okay. He so just listens. He just listens. John, I think that for my purposes, I think we've got some areas to work. I need to sit down with Leo because I think there's some discussions that took place that you may not know about. I think before your time. <clears throat> That's been an old. Uh, so I think we could work on the 33 issue. Um, and uh, I just think that it makes a lot of sense up here, particularly with the uh, energy dynamic opening these new areas, that the community get involved in the secondary business issue because it's just in the public interest that we are not, We're not saying we're not going to participate. We're just saying, come on, guys, this is a little bit unfair to have us pay for all this. And our estimate is well over $4 million. So, okay. So, um, as we come close, we'll go something that I think for me being fairly new. I think this is a big issue at Citywide, uh, not just Rick, but obviously others. Uh, so, how does this committee, how do we move forward and deal with it? My recommendation would be um, to, to number one, have an actual presentation, not just um, from obviously, we're hearing from some of the developers who own large land holdings up there. I'd like to know what they would like to build up there, what their plans are for development. But we need to get Heritage Land Bank in here to show us what they hold. Yeah, I thought what Robin was here for that. First I was here, she was here. Yeah, so I think because that's a big part of the puzzle that we need to understand the big overall view of not only what's held, but what people are wanting to develop being. And when I say people, I'm, I'm including the Heritage Land Bank. Mm -hmm. If they're planning on subdividing and creating 40 lots and then selling them or whatever, it would be helpful for us to know the big picture because then we can get a plan of. Um, development or a plan of attack because it seems like in this particular an area infrastructure is obviously lacking if we have a housing shortage and we want to be able to uh, assist in that economic boom then I think we need, we need a plan so I think uh, maybe um, at one of our next meetings or two we should have a plan to specifically vet this entire area I think it would help no I uh, I think it's an issue uh, it's always been an issue. I remember up on, I don't know what the road is, but up on Golden Valley, up by, uh, up by the middle school, uh, owns some property down there that, uh, that the road would have to be extended around or something. Well, it's the same thing with Eagle River. I mean, there's the same problem with Eagle yeah. River times five. Well, the, yeah. the, the safety, if there's if there's valid safety concern, <coughs> there needs to be done. And the question is who pays for it and how it's going to pay for it, seems to be. Well, it just, it just came in, so if someone had very few questions, well, they should. Uh, yeah, two minutes. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm looking for a substantial presentation. I want I want maps. I want to see what the Heritage Land Bank owns in relative, uh, in relation to everybody else and that whole area where we're lacking in infrastructure. So, just a one point of clarification it's not a proposal to subdivide, it's a 37 acre parcel that's for sale. Yeah, yeah. I want to understand what the zoning and all that. John? Just a quick point I wanted to make is the wildfire mitigation program within the fire department has experienced a, I, I call it an awakening, I think it's what one of the reporters called it, and we've had literally hundreds of requests from the public for these home inspections, and the public's very concerned from a safety standpoint. I had a meeting last night with 112 and um, our road area, and the big 
question on the top of everybody's mind is evacuation. How are we going to get out of here? Is the fire department, like, do you have a plan for us? So <coughs> leave it at that. Um, the, the interest from the public is uh, incredible right now. What are you telling? Good luck. <laughs> right. No, we, we do we, we <coughs> have an evacuation planning system. Of, of we have maps. We tell them it's going to be very di dynamic. It's going to depend on the wind direction, um, a lot of factors. So it's it's a decision that's made operationally on the fly. Okay, I think we need to adjourn because it's about 10:30. But thank you. I think we've highlighted some issues we could work on, and um, Rick, you could work personally with them. But we'll try to look at some things that hit the bigger view that hits all the development the city. See if we can come up with something. Looks like there's lots of good pieces we can try. Both your, I was just going to say both your areas because Eagle River has oh, a lot of these areas too. Eagle River Valley, yeah, Highland yeah. yeah. Road, Here's Big Ben.